All right, so we're live here. It is our um, the grand finale of our second day um, of the, 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 the three days for 103, uh, where we're celebrating what would have been Jack Kirby's um, 103rd birthday for three days. And um, so I'm Three I'm crazy Rand days. <laughs> In three days, I tell you. Um, <laughs> So we're, uh, I'm, I'm Rand Hoppy. I'm the executive director of the of the Jack Kirby Museum, and I'm Tom Kraft, the president of the Jack Kirby Museum, and we're both here with David Russell. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Dave, David is in Australia, so sometimes the the response time is is it's not as quick as like two guys on the East Coast in the middle of the sprawl. <laughs> so uh, we're uh, we're really happy to have David with us. Um, you'll learn about who David is and his experience and, and uh, comments on, on, on Jack Kirby. Of course, that's why we're here. But uh, I just want to say that we are uh, going live to Facebook and YouTube and Twitter via um, uh, Periscope. So please feel free to comment, uh, ask questions, and uh, we will get to them uh, later in the show. Um, but the, the venue is open for, for your comments. And um, so let's... Uh, Let's let's start off with the show. David's going to take us away for a little while. <laughs> so I'm a concept and storyboard artist and have been working in the film industry for almost 40 years. Jack Kirby was a friend and mentor for 22 years. And I'd like to talk a bit about how that friendship came together and some of the other rather interesting connecting points we had and, and his relationship to the world of film. This is a uh, selected list of my film credits. I've always been attracted to fantasy adventure and action adventure stories and find that I have the most fun in designing uh, images and storyboards for those kind of productions. Um, <laughs> each film requires from the artist uh, a new perspective. And this is one of the things that keeps the industry interesting. Uh, each director brings uh, a new idea about how he wants to control the narrative. And of course, each subject differs. One of the great things about film business, and kind of like the comic business, is that you never know, you know, from month to month, what kind of story you're going to be called to work on. Uh, very early in my career, the word got out that I was a specialist in these particular areas. But I also greatly enjoy working on comedy films and also with straight traumas. But ultimately, of course, it's the visionary kinds of films that I, I like the most. It's always hard to tell exactly where an artist uh, can pinpoint or you know, what time or what incident you can pinpoint where your own creative path started. And in this regard, there was a funny, funny parallel between myself and Jack Kirby. As a child, I was always thrilled when my mother would read me stories, fairy stories, and adventure stories, etc. And gradually I've developed a very strong uh, interest in reading and a particularly strong interest in mythology. And we're talking about age seven, eight, nine. And it was the uh, Norse mythology that struck me the strongest at that time. I remember the stories of Thor and Odin, and it just seemed to be the most fantastic and most vigorous and vital fantasy world I could possibly imagine. Of course, to our old ancestors, this was not fantasy at all. This was reality. This is how they saw cosmology. Now, you know, growing up as a, as a young black kid in, in Los Angeles, it would seem a bit strange that I might be attracted to this particular cosmology. But in later years, I discovered that, in fact, our family had links to both Norway and to Germany. So perhaps there's a bit of DNA memory <laughs> sort of welling up. Uh, you just never know. But when we think about Jack Kirby, here is a young man growing up in the US, very, very far removed from the Nordic world. And yet he also was greatly entranced by these stories, as we know. And this was one of the points of reference that when we first met, we were able to discuss and discover this mutual interest. Next. Please. I think for any kid growing up in the 50s, Superman was a big deal. He was certainly a big deal for me. The Superman comics were, I found, very inspirational. I still find them so today. And when the original television series with George Reeve hit the screens, I was particularly entranced by that. And I think 
that show was the other little bomb that went off that started to uh, propel me along my own creative path. Superman was an incredible character created by two you know, young boys and uh, uh, created an amazing world, an amazing, amazing world, which uh, even Jack Kirby admitted that people would still be reading stories about Superman 100 years from now. Next one. As I became a voracious reader, and uh, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, I was reading some of the classic stories, and of course, going into science fiction and fantasy in a serious way as well. All these things were laying down a platform, which I could later uh, reference as my career as an illustrator. Next one. But then something else happened. <laughs> I picked up the first copy of the Hulk magazine, and that set off an incredible bomb in my mind. And I can remembering being stunned, standing there at the drugstore, reading through the comic, looking at the artwork, and seeing a kind of way of composition and storytelling that I'd never seen before. And of course, this is our old pal. And this, more than any other incident, uh, propelled me toward my own creative path. The power of this particular narrative, the way Jack Kirby told his stories. Next. Some years later, uh, as the uh, fanzine industry, such as it was, was burgeoning, I found a place for myself amongst these other young teenagers who were so devoted to the comics. And I began to work as an artist for the fanzines, something that I continued for almost four years. It was a terrific experience. Most of the kids involved were in their mid to late teens, you know, the publishers, the writers, and the artists. We were all thrilled to have a forum to discuss comics and their creators. For a budding illustrator like myself, uh, the fanzines were a terrific opportunity to explore and develop my own comic drawings and receive feedback when published. And of course, I modeled my work after that of Jack Kirby, my first and most important influence. As time progressed, I got better at the craft of comic drawing and was, of course, very focused on becoming a Marvel artist once I'd finished uh, with college. And um, this seemed possible and certainly uh, desirable. I was in contact with some of the artists of the day and they were giving me some advice about, uh, you know, techniques, etc. cetera, Bach and Basima and various other artists. Next, please. And next. That's really cool though. <laughs> I'm glad you like that. <laughs> I attended my first comic book convention in 1970. My friend Scott Bloom and I traveled around the country uh, specifically to attend this particular event, and it was great. There were a lot of very interesting people there. Uh, I was able to meet Jim Steranko and, and other luminaries and learn more about uh, the comics industry. But it was an eye-opener, and it was, a, it was a terrific experience. We had a kind of a personal meeting with Jim Steranko and received a lot of the goss about the comics industry that uh, would have never heard otherwise. <laughs> Stranko has always been one of my favorite artists and I've incorporated some of his elements into my style as well. Next was, but it was at this San Diego comic book convention that I finally met Jack Kirby and it was a fortuitous event. I went there specifically, I was living in Los Angeles of course, and went there specifically to meet him, arrived early and entered an exhibition hall that was just setting up and, and just by chance there was Jack wandering around uh, alone for once and just getting ready to start the day himself. So I introduced myself and uh, we started having a conversation and uh, we just hit it off. I was surprised. He seemed to take to me and uh, among the many things we discussed in that first conversation, uh, was our mutual love of uh, Nordic mythology. And that sort of seemed to cement a connection between us as well. 
by the end of the conversation, he had invited me to his house, which was a great honor, and I look forward to having that first meeting. Next, please. My first meeting at Jax uh, was in 19, 1972, and I believe that Mark Evanier was there as well. He was involved in trying to start, uh, I think, a, a fan comic of one sort or another and was talking to me about doing the story. But it was wonderful to visit with Jack at that time, and uh, we had some very interesting discussions. And uh, it was uh, fascinating to watch this man's face as he talked about story. His eyes glowed, and there was an intensity that I had never experienced with anyone else. And as he began to talk about you know, the kind of stories he wanted to do in the future and, and some of the things he had done in the past, I realized that there was a whole universe about this man that I, didn't, that I knew nothing about and that uh, was certainly hinted at in the, uh, in the comics that he had been producing. And also a certain amount of sadness about the course of the industry and his treatment uh, by it, which certainly just became a huge issue as, as, as time progressed. And, and most of the people who are listening to this uh, podcast will know exactly what happened to uh, Kirby in his, uh, in his career uh, and, and, and travails uh, with legal issues regarding his properties. But more than anything else, Kirby uh, was humanist, and he engaged the world on a humanistic level. And uh, one of the terrific things about him was that uh, he grew up in a country and, and absorbed both the positive and negative uh, influences of that country, uh, understood that America was a very powerful and very progressive environment, but that also things could go very badly for you in that, in that same environment. He had experienced a great deal of that himself. This is a man who grew up in, in extreme poverty under very rough conditions, and when he finally achieves manhood, he's <laughs> given a rifle and, a, and an outfit and sent off to uh, Europe to fight the Nazis. He was uh, a very stalwart human being, and he all that energy and all those progressive ideals and also that grit are exhibited in every single uh, story he ever told. This, I find, was more common of a previous generation of comic book artists. Uh, they had a great deal of real-life experience. And, of course, that translated very well into their visual narratives. Kirby was exceptional that way. It's also extremely interesting to watch him actually draw. I sit and watch him draw at times. And, uh, I had heard, of course, that he didn't really need to erase. This seemed incomprehensible to me, but, of course, I was able to see that happening right in front of me. In effect, I think the narratives were pouring through his brain so intensely concentrated in his mind that I think no other medium other than comics served his purposes. Certainly working in film, which is something that he wanted to do uh, at one stage of his life, would have been a very clumsy and, and probably unsatisfying medium for a person with his kind of a mind. I think we should all be very grateful that he was able to work in comics and was interested in working in comics for such a long time because this proved to be the perfect medium for him. Next, please. Yes, Great photo, though. It's a wonderful photo. Yes, uh, it is. And it warms my heart every time I think about it. This was the last yeah. time. Looks no, like you're about six, foot, this fine. six feet tall. This was a, <laughs> yes, I'm 6'2". This was the last visit with Jack Kirby in 1993. At that time, I was working on a screenplay a story I had in mind. And uh, as was often the case, I would console Jack about these things. And, you know, he was now far beyond his drawing career. He had retired many years before. And we sat down on his couch and, and we talked about uh, Gliss and Shimmer, uh, Enchanters, this story that I had. And he uh, had a lot of ideas about it and uh, his own take on it. It was quite, quite illuminating. After that conversation was over, uh, Roz came up to me and said, wow, that was really amazing. I hadn't seen that glow in his eyes as he was talking about stories for many years. 
And that kind of encapsulates the kind of relationship that we had. Jack saw in me another storyteller, and he certainly knew that I respected him as possibly one of the world's most masterful storytellers, certainly one of the best artists America has ever produced. And because he was such a humble person, uh, he was not the kind of person that ever expressed a great deal of egocentricity. He, he was um, quietly happy with what he had accomplished in life, despite all the challenges. And he respected and admired other storytellers who were likewise dedicated. He was also a man who was very colorblind. And as you can imagine, that meant a great deal to me. Next, please. By the early 70s, I had begun to drift away from the idea of becoming a comic book artist and was now more focused as I began my training at Art Center College of Design as, uh, as an illustrator, uh, book and magazines and uh, other medium. One of the things that allowed me to continue using uh, the sort of Jack Kirby uh, uh, aesthetic model was murals. And in the early 70s, and right up and back to mid-70s, mid I created a series of murals in Los Angeles and in Seattle uh, for public works organizations. And this one was in downtown Los Angeles for several years. And I think the Kirby influence is fairly obvious. One of the things that working in murals sort of prepped me for was my future as an artist in the big screen. Because suddenly the canvas opened up very, very large. And using Kirby's narrative beats proved to be very, very effective. The graphics of this sort just leap right out at you. And probably scared half the population of Los Angeles. Next. Another mural in Los Angeles. All of these images, of course, have long since been destroyed, painted over. Next. And occasionally in private commissions as well. This is a four by six painting for a couple in California. I would be able to continue this Kirby S style. In the 1980s, I commissioned Jack to do several drawings for me as well. And here are two examples of those, both beautiful. And of course, representing some of my favorite characters in his pantheon. I'm still amazed to this day that this artist was able to draw as well as he did for such a long time. Our paths also intersected in the animation industry. Once Jack had finally finished, really with comics for the most part, uh, he moved into animation, which was a money earner. I don't think he was ever all that excited about it. But again, there were some interesting connections. This is a concept illustration for a proposed science fiction series based on the science fiction novels of Jack Vance, a series called Planet of Adventure. And uh, the uh, producer at the time hired Jack to do a series of concept illustrations to help sell the project. Project never sold, but, but I was aware of the works of Jack Vance. I greatly admired his science fiction output and fantasy output. And in fact, in 1977, when I was living in Seattle, uh, attended a writer's workshop that he and Frank Herbert were holding in the state of Washington. And meeting him there was quite as interesting as meeting Jack Kirby. The very amazing thing about Jack Vance is that he and Kirby shared the same birthday. Not the same year, but the same birthday. They were radically different people, but they were both master storytellers. More on Jack Vance later. <laughs> Next, please.
doing storyboards for animation, which is how I got into the business, I imagine was like doing Archie comics for someone like Jack Kirby. Um, while it was interesting to learn the beats of storyboarding in, in animation, animation at that time was exceedingly dull and practically dying. Disney certainly was in, in, in no shape, and Pixar was way, way, way in the future. While I was working for one of the animation companies, I heard that George Lucas was generating what we thought would be the last of the Star Wars films, then called Revenge of the Jedi. I determined at that point that I wanted to make the jump into live action storyboarding and concept illustration, but the barriers were, were very extreme. Certainly trying to get to Lucasfilm was almost impossible. Uh, they were receiving at that time perhaps 10 unsolicited portfolios from top artists across the world every day and then just sending them back unopened. Uh, by this time I had become friends with Jack Vance and I mentioned my problem to him. He lived in Oakland, California, just across the way from Lucas's studio. And uh, it turned out that Jack had been approached by Joe Johnson and Lucasville to auction one of his science fiction novels as a film. So he was in contact with Lucasfilm. So what he did was invite me to come up to Oakland that he would call Lucasfilm, uh, have his conversation, and then he would hand the phone off to me and whatever could be arranged could be arranged. It was up to me to try and make my pitch. And so I did this, I did this, there was no other option. Jack called Joe Johnson and had a conversation with him and then I got on the line and very likely because they wanted to keep Jack Vance happy, they agreed to an interview. But when Johnson saw my work and Lucas saw my work, I was offered a job as a storyboard artist on Return of the Jedi, and uh, that kicked off my career. Amongst the artworks that were included in my portfolio, of course, were a lot of Jack Kirby-inspired artwork. And only much later did I learn about how intimately George Lucas's Star Wars world and Jack Kirby's world were intertwined. Perhaps intertwined is not the right word. Most of us who are, are familiar with Jack's works know that, in fact, Lucas and Kirby had some interesting conversations in the mid-70s, and that Jack Kirby had in, invented certain concepts which were grafted directly into the Star Wars world. Jack Kirby invented the Source, a mystic energy force, which then became the Force. There was a character named Heeman, who became the model for Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then, of course, there was Darkseid, the great master villain, and his son, Orion, who was unaware that he was the son of this evil man. Many, many correspondences, of course, and uh, why not? In many ways, the original Star Wars film, New Hope, was an amalgam of several uh, several ideas, including many of Lucas's own. And we were all, those of us who were around at the time and saw that first Star Wars film and were just gasping and amazing at some of these incredible shots, including this one, it did make me think, what would that film have looked like if Jack Kirby had been the designated designer instead of the equally talented uh, Ralph McQuarrie. Certainly one of the things that uh, Lucas was able to accomplish in that film was a tremendous sense of scale, and this is something Jack Kirby was a master of. And I rather think the film might have benefited with a more exotic look something that was not modeled on, say, World War II technology, but was really quite imaginative and quite new. Still, no one's complaining about Star Wars. But Jack Kirby, Jack Kirby, was really the one that took us there. Next, please. Lucas. He is not the only filmmaker who has been greatly influenced by Jack Kirby's work. Here's a short list of directors who acknowledge Kirby's contribution to their own stylistic approaches to filmmaking. Now, 
this is a very, very impressive list and should remind everyone just how much impact Jack Kirby has had on all the film narratives that stick so strongly in our minds, the most imaginative. And of course, I've worked with several of those directors and can personally confirm that this is the case. So the art of storyboarding, the art of storyboarding is to provide a roadmap of a film. In a sense, it's like doing comics. But here's the thing that's really interesting. Taking a look at this Jack Kirby page, and let's take a look at these panels. Topmost panel, Silver Surfer and Galactus. Great composition. It's also a low angle shot. It's also a Dutch angle shot in our terminology as filmmakers. And then off to the left in the middle, that is an over the shoulder shot. And then to the right, that is an extreme close up. Bottom left, close up. And then finally on the right, low angle. This is the language of film. While I was studying Kirby's comics so intensely and enjoying his narrative flow, I was also learning the beats of storyboarding for film because he himself was an avid you know, film goer and he had incorporated some of those beats into his earliest comics. And so by the time I got formally involved in the film industry, I found that I was already miles ahead of many other storyboard artists because I had absorbed all of Kirby's narrative beats. And these were directly applicable to filmmaking. And they made my storyboards, generally speaking, far more active and kinetic than those of many of my associates. This painting by Rubens has a connection to Jack Kirby as well. We note in this composition that there's only one single unmoving rather uh, central object in the composition itself, this hippopotamus undergoing this attack. There's a swirling motion that is circular that keeps taking the eye around and around the composition and all the strong diagonals lead you back to this beleaguered beast as well. Extremely interesting composition. Next, please. Well, Jack Kirby had studied the old masters as well <laughs> in his own time and in his own way. And this is exactly what's happening in this piece I commissioned for him. We have the same circular activity going on. The only stable character is Galactus. Everyone else is in total motion. But we keep moving around. The eye keeps moving around the composition. And this man, this man was able to do this day in and day out for decades. And I look at this composition now, and I'm still in awe. <laughs> And then I think back to the original Fantastic Four film, and I cannot remember a single shot in that film yeah. that had half of this dynamism. Next, please. Hmm, back to the Nordic world. <laughs> I would have been very happy if in the Thor films, more reference to Kirby's designs of Asgard were used rather than the tendency for production designers and concept designers to imagine that they can do a better version. So instead we end up with this sort of monotone uh, church organ as Asgard <laughs> instead of this rather colorful and dynamic depiction. Certainly the artist has referenced to some degree Kirby's work, but they could not make integrative sense of the design. Obviously, there's not much of Asgard to be seen in Kirby's design, but we know from the comics that he realized this world very, very, very clearly. But the lack of color, the lack of comprehensive design is something that has plagued all of the Marvel films. And with Kirby's incredible visual narratives at hand to be referenced, it still amazes me that that was the case. Next, please.
Why do I like being a storyboard artist? This is why. You want to be as close to receiving that empty white sheet of paper as possible. And what happens when a film is designed? The script is written. And, and until a storyboard artist or a concept artist is brought on, the film only exists as written material. It has not been visualized. And so you're called in to work with the director to work out the visual narrative of the film. This gives you an enormous amount of control and influence over it. Your job is to realize the director's vision. But if and when, and it has often happens, there's a gap in how they might understand or how to, how to make the script stronger, that's where you come in. And this chart shows how that information flows back down to all the other departments. Next, please. Although it's true that a lot of storyboard artists in film have a background in comics and sometimes in animation, others simply come from a straight illustration background or an unrelated field. They can learn the beats, certainly learn the beats of how to tell a story in film. But you want to maximize every second in a film. And this is a fairly typical example of how one artist would approach it and then how I would approach it. This is for the film. Uh, the Wolverine. Here we have our ninja motorcyclist knocking uh, Wolverine off the top of the truck. It's certainly an adequate composition, but from my perspective, with this Kirby mind that I still have, it's far too dull. So when asked to rework the shot, this was my response. Two other influences other than Jack Kirby, Frank Rosetta and N.C. Wyeth have informed and guided me throughout my career. And there are elements in the works of both those artists that both remind you of Kirby. And I think that Kirby himself took cues from. Next one. To this day, I still get opportunities every once in a while to go totally Kirby-esque in concept illustration and in storyboards. You know, I have my own specific style and have, you know, developed that over the years. But every once in a while, a project allows me to go back to that kind of aesthetic. And mind you, whenever I go into a studio to work on a film production, I always put on my wall several examples of Jack's works. And Obviously, I want to be inspired by them while I'm working on a particular production, but I also want the other creatives to come in and look at this work and be reminded, those who have not been exposed to it, to be reminded about how strong a visual narrative can be. And there have been other times uh, when I've been working with junior illustrators when I would actually give them pages from you know, the more dynamic Kirby comics and ask them to look at them like a storyboard artist, not as someone who's enjoying a comic but someone who's looking at it as a filmic possibility to sort of upskill their uh, ideas about how strong a visual narrative can be. Next one. There have been four times in my career where I've encountered people who challenged the idea that Jack Kirby could draw as fast or as dynamically as he did. And whenever that occurs, I issue the Kirby challenge. I ask them to give me a topic, a subject, and I will design a cover, as Jack would have been able to do, in less than an hour. And this is an example of one of those. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> They're not going to get the best of me or my pal. <laughs> Next, please. And then even, even more rare occasions, I'm able to go full Kirby as with this storyboard for the, uh, one of the Avengers uh, video games. Next, please. Kirby's work is now collected. 
by avid fans across the world. Heritage Auctions has sold many of his pieces. And uh, I'm assuming that the George Lucas Illustration Museum will also have a fair number on display once that uh, incredible museum is, is finished. Heritage Auctions also, and I don't mean this as a pitch, also sells some of my original film artwork in its periodic uh, auction sales. I'm kind of happy that Jack's work is moving through these kinds of marketing lines because the people who buy this work want to take care of it. And if they on sell it, they'll be selling it on to somebody else who also will want to take care of it or recognize its value. The studios, the publishers never recognize the value of this kind of artwork, but the market itself has responded. And that's really wonderful. Many of the great artworks from the past, uh, the great works of the Renaissance artists, many of them survive because they were held in private collections, not because they were held by the church or other organizations, which you know waxed and waned as time went on, but the families tend to last. So it's a way of ensuring that, that some of your work will continue on into the future. So that's me. That's my history <laughs> with Jack. Wow. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. It was really Thank good. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed this. I have never met such a rich soul in my entire life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the, the the few times I I spent with him, it was uh, yeah, it was convention time or and one interview, but it it all makes sense. All the you know, the people who were closer to him, like you, it, I definitely had that a sense of that, and, and and comes all the videos that we've we've acquired for the museum's collections and the audios, it's uh, it's pretty clear how 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 absolutely incredible uh, a humanist. He was a, a stalwart humanist, as, as you said, which is just great. Yes, yes. It's, it's worth noting, particularly for contemporary audiences and, and fans of comics and speculative fiction, that Kirby was very, very focused on revealing not only the, the negativity of uh, the human existence, but, but focusing instead primarily on the positive aspects of the human condition. He knew both sides very, very well indeed, and he was fortunate as an artist to be able to interpret that and put it into a form that could reach so many millions of people. What I find now, and, and this stresses me to no end, is that a, a lot of contemporary filmmakers, and certainly, particularly since the 80s, uh, comic book artists, have instead pushed most of the narratives into a very dark and negative sort of uh, milieu which is both depressing and also kind of presses futility uh, yeah. that there's no effort that a person can make that can result in a positive change and that the heroes are so compromised that they're not really heroes at all i don't think this is the way to handle this kind of material and it certainly has a very negative effect on the viewers who are basically put into a state of apathy if there's no way to stop evil then why should i even try in the past, we relied on the heroes and their overly bright stories and their, and their two pat endings. We understand all of that. But throughout all those stories, there was a struggle to transform darkness into brightness. Now, there is simply wallowing in darkness for the most part. Yeah, and I think this is now being reflected in larger American society. And you know, even globally, this is having an influence. This is something that I think would have disturbed and depressed Kirby to a great degree. I, I agree. Yeah, I, I'm I'm always uh, reminded of how a guy like him, just to put it plainly, a guy like him, having had the life that he did, could still make a comic book in the in the early '70s, like the Forever People, and how they the the youthful um, children of like hope and and peace and love. Uh, Confronting the ultimate evil and, and, and such like that. It, 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 we've been doing a, a series of looking at the fourth world, and I'm just reminded about how, you know, there, there's Jack like doing doing the the, the stories of, of hope and and um, and love, you know, and it, it's pretty strong stuff. 
You're very That's right true. about that, Rand, and those are those are very clear observations. Mm -hmm. The reality is, the reality is, and it's unfortunate that the people who manage to get the reins of society always try to convince you that conflict is one of our greatest uh, attributes, when in fact cooperation is our greatest attribute it's as human greatest. beings. Yep, that's right. And Kirby understood that very well. Yeah. He knew that you had to fight to get there, that there were conflicts involved in oh, just even being able to set up an environment of cooperation. But, but, and uh, this is something we need to understand as quickly as possible uh, in, in current political and social scene. Yes. <laughs> So uh, you know everybody's very very really enjoyed the the, 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 the uh, your presentation and your commentary in in the chat. I I, I don't really uh, I can't uh, you know there's just uh, you know stuff like that and uh, you know, stuff like Stefano in Italy. Uh, just what it's been it's I think I think I think you're a hit. <laughs> <laughs> you're a sensation. <laughs> <laughs> and, well. Well, thank you, but uh, we all had a rather terrific guy through all of this. That, it's can true. Up, can you please put up the last slide? There we go. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. Before I before I sign off for the day here, a very a very wise man once said that uh, when in that in that amazing future humans finally reach the end of the universe, they're going to find Jack Kirby's signature somewhere in the corner. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that is I, that, that. knowing knowing what I know about that man and his capabilities. I rather think that they'll actually encounter Jack himself in some amazing cosmic environment, and uh, he'll greet these people with a grin and and ask them, "Well, fellas, uh, what took you so long to get here? <laughs> to get out here?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So with that, I'll say goodbye and uh, thank, thank you, David. You again. Thank you very much again for the time and allowing me the, this moment to speak about my dear friend and uh, and tremendous mentor, person who I will never ever forget. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night or a good morning. Good luck. All right. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Wow, David Russell, holy smokes, thank you. Um, so I guess I'm gonna end the, end the show and we're gonna go and get ready for the auction, right? We'll be back in about 10 minutes. Back in about 10 minutes. So see, see you soon, everybody. Thank you.